So now in, in section 9.2, it's going to start to discuss specifics of, the, of cellular receptors and their activation. Let's start with talking about ligands, which represent the signaling molecules. These signaling molecules are going to use non-covalent interactions to bind to receptors with high degrees of specificity. So here's what it essentially looks like. Ligand plus receptor forms a ligand receptor complex. Now, while I draw the arrow in one way, there's an equilibrium here based on how tightly the ligand binds to the receptor. So you have a binding constant, which represents how much of the ligand you need to bind half of those receptors. So there's an equilibrium here. And the better the ligand binds to the receptor, the more it favors this complex. And the, with the less specificity uh, the ligand binds receptor, it's going to favor this side of the equation. This is not very different than what we've already learned about already. We have a substrate that bound to enzyme that formed a complex, substrate enzyme complex. And we know there was a certain degree of specificity there as well, a certain rate of reaction that was dependent on that specificity. So as a result of ligand binding receptor, it forms this complex that initiates a change in the protein structure. And we know that any time you introduce a conformational change in protein, you're also going to introduce a, a, a different function, an altered function. And as I said before, then, once that complex falls apart, the ligands release, the receptor goes back to its original state, and it's no longer activated. Here's a great example. Here we have a boot-looking protein. Again, it's important to point this out. Extracellular domain facing outside the cell. Intracellular domain that's in the cytoplasm. The binding of a ligand, in this case, to this protein happens outside the cell. This causes a change in the protein conformation. It induces a conformational change which results in the intracellular receptor changing shape and activity. And now this receptor, because it's in the cytoplasm, can target cellular proteins. At some point, based on the affinity of the signal to the protein, that uh, signal is then released. The protein goes back to its original state. And now that protein is in the off position no longer being able to target and initiate a cellular response. So what type of cell surface receptors are there? There are three classes we're going to talk about. Enzyme-linked receptor found in all species. The extracellular domain is a signal binding domain. The intracellular domain is what has the catalytic activity. So the part of the protein that's in the cytoplasm can actually catalyze a chemical reaction. Specifically, they catalyze the um, transfer of phosphates uh, between proteins. And that's going to be very important because we know the addition of a small molecule to a protein can introduce a conformational shift, which again regulates the activity of that protein. Here we have it. There's the intracellular domain, extracellular domain. Binding of receptor activates the enzyme. The enzyme is able to use ATP as a source of its phosphate, uh, targets a protein to be phosphorylated. That protein undergoes a conformational change, and that conformational change introduces a functional change as well. So now that protein is either going to be turned on to go do something else, or it's going to be turned off, prevented from doing something else. But it's the receptor itself that is transferring the phosphate to its target. G protein coupled receptors, there's already a lecture on this, but I'll quickly go through it. G protein coupled receptors get its name because they're associated with nucleotides, the uh, guanine based nucleotides. It actually, in its off state, is bound to GDP. Binding of receptor causes a change that results in the swapping or the exchange of GDP for GTP. And it's that GTP bound form that ultimately creates the active receptor. Here we go.
G protein coupled receptor, seven transmembrane uh, spanning domains. We can see, uh, I believe they're going to be probably alpha helices if I had to, to bet on it. Here we see these are uh, in the off state. Receptor binds specifically to the G protein coupled receptor. When in its active state, we can see that the protein now can bind to a protein in the cell called a G protein. This is a lipid anchored protein that when associated, when not associated with the receptor has GDP bound. Now when the receptor is on and there's now an attraction and an, aff an affinity for G protein to its cognizant, uh, to its receptor, the GDP is released and GTP is then bound. And now in its GTP bound state, this protein is active and that protein can go target other proteins to mount a response. Now, just as, and I think it's important, just as we have to turn on pathways, those pathways ultimately have to turn off as well. We can't have them stay on forever. It's not going to be a good use of resources. Plus, the response may ultimately be detrimental if this occurs uh, too often. For example, cell division. We have signals that tell cells to divide. Well, if you can't turn off a cell signaling pathway that tells a cell to divide and it keeps dividing, we know the outcome of that is a mass of cells that ultimately can become malignant, right? Can ultimately result in cancer. So in order to turn off this particular uh, pathway, we simply hydrolyze the GTP, releasing an inorganic phosphate, and thus having it go back to the GDP form in which these three subunits now reassemble. So the GTP form is the active form in which the beta and gamma separate from the alpha subunit in its inactive form, they form, reform the trimer and wait then to be signaled again. Ligand gated ion channels, these actually you've seen uh, in anatomy and physiology more than once, where the binding of a ligand, like a neurotransmitter for example, causes the receptor to open up and allow the flow of specific ions from high to low concentration. So we know, for example, in animals, nerve and muscle cells, uh, we see this phenomenon where calcium plays an extremely important role in regulating the contracted state of the muscle. So here we have receptor closed. We see a gradient of these ions. Those gra that gradient is unstable, but can't do anything until the protein opens. That protein will only open when it's appropriate in response to a signal. When the signal binds, the channel opens, now the ions can flow freely down their gradient. Now when in the cytosol, those particular ions can now mount a cellular response. This doesn't have to be the cell membrane. This could be the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, for example. So it's not just at the cell surface that this can happen. This can also happen within the eukaryotic cell itself. Now we've talked a lot about receptors on the cell surface, having an extracellular domain and an intracellular domain, and that those working together. But what for those receptors that are inside the cell, how do they respond? Well, the only way you can get a receptor that's already in the cytoplasm to respond is to have a signal that's able to diffuse through the membrane. These have to be small signal molecules. These need to be lipid-based molecules. Hormones, certain hormones are great examples. Estrogen is a great example of a lipid-based hormone. It's able to pass through the cell membrane and bind to its receptor in the nucleus. When that receptor is bound, it's able to regulate the expression of genes that respond to estrogen. There we go. Small steroid, right? Four fused rings diffuses not only through and across the cell membrane, also diffuses across the nuclear envelope, binding its receptor in the nucleus. The activated receptor binds to DNA, resulting in the expression of proteins that are required in response to the hormone. So this is a great example of not only having a series of proteins that sense the environment by being threaded in the cell membrane, but also 
the ability of receptors to respond to signals that may be located already in the cell.